I'm sure many of you were looking to see Peter Provenos show up right now, and Peter was called back, so I guess we could call myself the, the taller, blonder version in some ways. Um, I, I know that they are huge uh, shoes to fill, and so I'm very appreciative of my panel colleagues uh, being patient and thoughtful with me as we go through uh, the discussion of what is really important. Uh, I never hear a, a patient family story that I just don't have this pain in my stomach. I don't think any of us do. I think we all uh, were drawn to healthcare because we care, because we want to make a difference, because we want something to be better. And people have talked over this, on this stage over the last 24 hours about the failures. Like, why haven't we gone further? And the one thing I loved about Carol's video is the very obvious point. Patients and families want to be a part of the solution. And the solutions may not be within us. And so we've talked for a long time, I think with a degree of rhetoric and insincerity in healthcare leadership about patients and families as partners. I look at the fact that that doesn't exist today in a meaningful way as a leadership failure. We as leaders in healthcare, if we don't make it comfortable, if we don't make it easy, if we don't make it a requirement, it's not going to happen. And so this leadership failure actually needs to change. And in that change, I think is the path forward. The path forward of true partnership, the path forward of listening to the voice of the patient. And as, as Peter said to us yesterday, the path forward in love, in compassion, in commitment, and in that alignment. We know, and I use this phrase often in my day job, culture eats strategy every day of the week. There is absolutely no one else responsible for culture in any healthcare organization or in any company besides the leadership. You establish the culture, you feed the culture, you nourish the culture, and if you don't do that every minute of every day, your culture will fail. And when the culture fails, in our industry, bad things happen. They happen to vulnerable, precious, thoughtful individuals who are someone's mother, brother, sister, child. So we have to recognize that this is a gift that we are privileged to have. The other thing that strikes me about uh, Carol's video and being a part of the solution is that we do have to fundamentally change some of our paradigms. You know, I'm blessed to have amongst us in this audience so many people from the field of anesthesia, so many surgical colleagues. And, you know, Peter, as the owner and developer of many checklists along with a tool, I'm a firm believer in checklists. But fundamentally, what does a checklist do besides what I'll call, in very simplistic terms, the recipe. It's the pause. We have an urgency addiction. That urgency addiction, many times, is the cause of error. When if we just paused, if we just thought for a second, because in healthcare, we have the biggest and the brightest and the smartest people around us. And it only takes that second to make us think about what we're doing. That pause is one of the most powerful things that we can do, every single one of us. And we all know that that pause leads to more effective care. Use the checklist, think about what we're doing, ponder for a millisecond, and we will save lives. I wanted to share a brief story of one of the positive things that happened for us in my organization that I'm super proud of with the pause. And it talks about the concept of surgery. So I can remember growing up 
and my dad would have need for periodic surgery, and people would say to him, oh, Glenn, it's good, you're gonna take a nap, it's gonna be fine, you'll feel better, you'll be all rested. Boy, did we not know what we were talking about, right? <laughs> Most of my professional colleagues in the audience would say, yeah, um, uh, a minor surgery is like running a marathon, <laughs> a good old 5K, and then you wonder why you come out the other end and it doesn't work so well. <laughs> well, let's think about that. For as long as I can remember, in my own organization, short of true emergencies, right? When did you have surgery? Well, when the surgeon had the next block and the next slot was available. <laughs> let's go, let's get her done, as they would say. And, say, and in that vein, I think we all know, too, that the outcomes from an accelerated surgical path sometimes can be great and sometimes can't. And so we as an organization were having probably too many surgical complications. And they were happening in elective cases and kind of semi-urgent cases. So what do you do about that? So we were fortunate enough to have some physician leaders um, who introduced us to uh, the RAI tool, which is a risk analysis index that we adopted two and a half years ago. We now have 350,000 data points completed by 200 surgeons where we know if a patient is frail. And we've mandated that being done, and we've mandated the pause. Guess what? 21% of the people that we did that index in never ended up having surgery. Never. There was a better plan. 4% of them had a lesser surgery. 50 plus percent of them had prehab. They got stronger before we did what we needed to do. And only 20% went on as planned. The learnings from the serious events that occurred after our surgeries forced us to reflect and think about the pause. And the greatest thing about that tool, self-administered by a patient in less than 60 seconds. Doesn't take much time, 60 seconds of pause. So we need to harness these thoughts from all of us and think about what it takes to wire into the infrastructure of our organizations the positive feedback from our patients, our families, that say to us, I know we can do better and I wanna help you do better. So with that, I'd like to invite my panel members to come up and join us. We're very privileged to have Carol with us, who will articulate and share a little bit more about her stories. Tom, who uh, you met earlier today, who was the leader of uh, our Respiratory Association. Um, Cliff, who is sitting down uh, beside, who's our immediate past president uh, for, uh, uh, and chairman of the board for uh, ISQA, and um, our dear friend, Helen from uh, Memorial Care here locally. So what a distinguished group to have together and it's really a privilege to, to be with all of you. So Carol, um, starting with you, uh, I can't imagine the loss of a child, I can't. Um, but somehow you've gone forward from there and you've thought about how do you become a partner. So tell us a little bit more about your belief in that next generation of patient safety and how we need to go forward. Maya Angelou once said, there's no greater agony than that of an untold story inside you. When these events happen to us, we need to be heard, and oftentimes our voice is never recognized, and yet we're the one constant in our loved ones, um, in their room, with them. And so having the opportunity to tell what happened is important to us. And that propels us and we start to share our stories. But then we evolve. The stories get us into this, 
But we have so much more to contribute than just our stories. We look at healthcare differently, you know, depending on our background. Whether we're a policeman like Jack Gentry, a teacher, um, an architect, and yes, to you, some hospitals demise even lawyers, you know, that come in. But we we want to help because we know that you all can't do it alone. Yeah. Well, that's so powerful, and and I think that as you know, this it, it requires leadership to make it safe. I can remember many years ago, Don Berwick advocating for the co-hospital president being a patient. So, um, Helen, tell me a little bit about you know, your reaction and how your organization has tried to embrace some of the positive changes that have come from your learnings and, and what you've done to uh, yeah. advance those. I say we're sorry. Yeah. Um, I think a couple things. Um, uh, I work at a health system right around the corner, Memorial Care. We have four hospitals and a lot of ambulatory sites and the like, and so you know, so much harm and, uh, and to focus on. And some of the things, um, this is my third health system I've been able to work on improving safety. And I think there's four things that, well, really five things that come to mind. Exactly what Carol said, which is really involving patients and families very fast um, and being transparent and having those conversations early, and we've made that transition, and so um, it's, you know, you wish it had never happened, but the fact that it did, um, then there's a way to, to work through that together. Um, the second is um, really having these bold goals for quality and safety, and not just striving for better than or half of, but really striving for zero. Um, or always, depending on what it is. Um, and so I can talk a little bit more about that. Um, the third is patient stories matter. Um, and so um, the patient can come in and tell their story and we need to, passing that through the organization and making sure that it hits every meeting and that the, it's sort of translated and, and used for good. Um, so we don't start any of our board meetings, quality committee meetings, medical exec, you know, the list goes on without telling a story at the very first part of the meeting. Because it gets everybody uh, in the right frame of mind, they put their devices down, they start listening and start focusing. Um, the fourth is really involving patients in design. So we have, um, in addition to working on a specific, uh, if something happened, you know, making sure we understand what that was and how we can prevent it, um, involving patients in patient family advisory committees and lean. So we have a lot of lean redesign we're doing and the very first, first thing on our checklist for a lean event is can a patient and family, uh, would they be in, great to be involved in this particular one because you get Every single time when we do that, we have great learnings about, okay, you want to work on that, but actually what I think you should work on is this, and it, it's so helpful. And the, and the last one is really resourcing this. So I'm on our leadership team for our system, and we, we resource this. We have teams and task forces, and, and we put um, financial uh, support behind these teams to make these changes, because they don't just sort of happen out of thin air, and so it's that organizational will to move it all forward. That's, uh, I think that's so important when you talk about the design and the incorporation into the design. And, you know, Cliff, as a, as a leader of one of the most esteemed oversight organizations in the world in this space, I'm, I'm sure when you think about the infrastructure, that's a lot about what enables this success to happen. So, you know, share with us your thoughts on how that infrastructure has changed through the years and what you think we need to do more to, to make it better uh, for the next generation? Well, that's a pretty big question. Well, but you, you have broad shoulders. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think one of the things we need to do is firstly just have a look at the societies within which we live and, and recognise the differences uh, that we have to look at. We recognise that things do go wrong in healthcare, mm -hmm. but how do we handle that? Mm -hmm. Do we handle that as, oh, well, that was just another fall, that was just another pressure injury, that was just another bleed? Or do we think here is a person who has been impacted by what we euphemistically called an incident? We need to go beyond that and think, how did the incident occur? And what can we do to stop it occurring again? And look actually at ourselves. There's a very interesting book uh, called The Road to Character by David Brooks, who is a uh, New York Times journalist. Uh, he talks about language towards the end of his book 
And he says there's been a change in language. He, he talks about Google engrams where they can actually tell you how many times a word is being used. And there are some words which are increasing in use. I can do it. Self. Me. There are other words which are decreasing, and this is, I think, something that causes us to think about your pause. They are words like bravery, yes. humbleness, kindness, mm -hmm. and they're disappearing from the language. Kindness is used uh, only half as much as it used to be just a few years oh, ago. That's sad. And I think sometimes what happens in healthcare is that, that we get so caught up in the churn, the busyness, chasing lab results, whatever else, to stop and think, what does this mean for the person that I've just encountered? And, and that's not a new phenomenon. Um, in fact, there's a story that's about 2,000 years old about a man who was beaten up walking down a road uh, by a bunch of, of bandits. Uh, and he was lying there, naked, bleeding, probably dying. The legal establishment walked past. They had other things on their mind. The religious organisations walked past. They had other things on their mind. A would-be enemy noticed him, noticed him, noticed the patient, crossed the road, touched him, barred up his wounds, put some clothes on him, put him on his horse, gave him some money, sent him off to a hotel, and paid the hotel bill, by the way, where's Larry? Wow. Good example we heard this morning. What had happened? The Good Samaritan had recognised the vulnerability that we as patients and we who serve our patients, because we both end up being vulnerable, but he took the vulnerabilities themselves on himself. And that's the challenge to us, I think, uh, in this movement. Uh, as caring professions, as managers providing services for the caring pro professions, to say, I've paused, I've thought, there's a deeper problem here. Let's see what I can do about looking after this person who needs all the help they can to get back on the journey to a healthy lifestyle. And I think that's the real challenge. Uh, and, and the infrastructure things are necessary, but they need to come out of an ethos of caring, compassionate caring, the micro moment of contact as Peter described it last night. Yes, yes, so beautifully stated. And you know, when you reflect on those points, it also, you can't help but go into what I feel is the one of the drivers of the clinician burnout, mm. lack of engagement, whatever words you want to use. I think it is that absence of kindness, connection, love, emotion, that is catapulting that and, and making our work even harder mm -hmm. because it's Precisely. the exact opposite of where we need to go. So, Tom, you know, you lead a group of professions, professionals, excuse me, who um, have, have always been many times an unsung hero at the bedside. Sure. And, uh, and, and yet are very passionate about doing things right. And uh, how, do you, how do you bring that group forward and keep them not only motivated, but engaged in doing the right things and hearing the voice of the patients and families in that activity? I think at the local level, I think as a leader in your hospital, you need to treat your staff with respect and respect the, the conditions that they're working under. In the hospitals, we are expected to work at a productivity level, level oftentimes over 100%. And that's just, that is not safe. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be able to be empathize with our staff and, and be there for them. Ultimately, that'll protect the patients as well. Mm -hmm. uh, as an organization, we want to make sure that um, we have a competent respiratory therapist caring for patients. And we have an initiative now that we're trying to raise a level up of the therapist to a uh, bachelor's level at, upon graduation and the highest credential, which is registered respiratory therapist. We're not the respiratory therapist of the 60s anymore, and we need to uh, progress to that today. Yeah, mm. That's, uh, it's so true that, um, you know, and th that creates that sense of pride, too, yeah. and feeling good about the work that they're doing. Um, so, Carol, as you've gone forward 
um, and have embraced your professional career, how, uh, how have all of your uh, life experiences, how have you, they affected you professionally and where you put your effort and energy in, in those change variables? I think um, I've had to reframe how I look at some things. Um, in, in particular, I think our next journey with healthcare is switching from that safety one mindset to safety two. And, and for those of you that don't know what that is, is safety one, we've always been reactive. We're going there after. Safety two is how do we be proactive, but more importantly, how do we have a positive system? And so. An analogy I can give you, yesterday Peter was talking about the runner, and I, I happen to be a runner. And when you train for a race, I was always training to do it right. But the fact is, most of the time, I was striving for something. What I've changed my mindset is, I was doing it right most of the time. What I needed to do was, when I did something wrong, was how did I pick myself up like a child, learn from that, mm -hmm. and improve upon it? To me, that is safety, too. What are we doing right? Let's celebrate what we're doing right. Um, and let's bring that joy and meaning back into the workplace. We can't walk away from learning from the things that went wrong, but there's so much we can learn from what went right. So part of me is, as I engage more in the systems, how do I, how do I reframe? And I think we all are at a point now we have to reframe how we look at healthcare. The um, you know the comments we've heard over the last day of you know God ain't it awful right you know that that creates such a feeling in us but it probably isn't the most motivating feeling God ain't it awful that sense of helplessness and responsibility and personal pain that comes when you feel the failure of something that you're accountable for. And, and sometimes I think that's been the, the leadership failure like why? Why doesn't it motivate some people? And, and then you go back and you realize maybe folks really don't know what to do, right? Which is where the science, the apps, uh, even techniques like process improvement and, and lean. So uh, Helen, tell a little bit more about maybe some examples where you've yeah. been able to maybe convert a leader within one of the organizations you've worked with to realize like you can do something. God, it is awful, but now what? Yes, um, I'm a big student of IHI Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and one of the things that we say there is it's, it's will, ideas, and execution. Um, and so the first, the first word is will, and so you have to kind of harness that organizational collective. And, and sometimes it, it really does start at just being straight up honest about these are the number of patients that do not leave our institution alive. These are the number of infections, not rates, numbers. Um, and here's where we really sit and by what type and in what unit. Here are the number of, you know, you can just keep going down the list and making sure that every leader in the organization is well aware. They can talk about their financial metrics from the last month, but if you ask most leaders, what's our mortality rate around here, they won't be able to tell you. So part of it is just that initial education of getting everybody onto the same place. We actually convened a leadership summit. We have it every year. We pulled our board members, our physician leaders, our executives into a room and laid all those numbers out in front of them. That was 2006. Um, and we, uh, through that um, process, actually arrived at these things. Initially, with the, they were the goals, and they said, well, what are those? I said, well, they're goals, and they're really bold. And they said, okay, the bold goals. Anyway, <laughs> so we have these bold goals, and we work on them every year, and we are um, really taking each, we have about 11 of them now, striving, every single one, to push the boundary. We look outside our organization, but mostly we're comparing ourselves to ourselves, and we're striving for zero. I mean, who cares if somebody else is at one? If we're at 0.5, we should get to zero. Um, and so um, one of the things that we found the most helpful to really get this to done, uh, we're in a um, hospital system where we don't employ physicians uh, or healthcare, uh, so 90% of our physicians are not employed. So we have something called a physician society and a series of best practice teams, and they've been amazing. Dr. LaGrue's here in the audience, and he helped st start one of our women's health best practice teams. Um, they're clinicians, so not just physicians, pharmacists, nurses, respiratory therapists, dietitians, and we come together and we learn, we take what's working well and we figure out how to spread it. So kind of go to what Carol mentioned, because, um, and sometimes it's evidence-based, sometimes it's just practice-based evidence. There's a difference. And we take that and then we harness it. Um, I'll give you a good example. 
Um, we, when I got there in 2006, um, I had come from St. Joe's actually, and we had already done rapid response teams. I got to Memorial Care and they had never heard of one. I'm like, oh, how is this possible? Anyway, so um, we, we got everybody together and said, you know, how can we pull this off? How can we not wait for the patient to get in trouble? How can we get there earlier? And there was a lot of discussion, like, oh, well, you know, what's the evidence around this? I'm like, okay, how much evidence do you need to say if you get there earlier, it's going to help? You know, it just sort of makes sense. So um, we actually ended up working with respiratory therapists and a few really passionate folks, and then uh, nurses from the ICU, got some physician champions, and we put it in place. Um, we've actually reduced our in-house mortality by, um, from about 108% of expected to 90%, that's 230 patients a year who are not dying who would have, um, just based on the statistics. And so um, those kinds of things, and then when you share that data back with the team, so the next leadership summit, when we say, well, this is what, this is what you did, this is what we did, then people get that will to take the next idea and execute on it. So part of it's creating this organizational muscle, if you will, to do the work, do the deep improvement work and move it out um, and through teams. That's, uh, that's so true. Tom, someone sent a comment to you be uh, already that said uh, respiratory therapists are the front line of our hospital and you are the ones doing the rescuing. Yeah. Um, and uh, they wanted to thank you and uh, your profession for all they do. Thank you. So. Um. Um, in that vein, in, within your association, I'm sure when you first embraced the concept of striving towards zero, you had a lot of folks that were like, huh, what, are you kidding me? How, how, does a, how, does, how did you work to overcome that? And, and did you partner with patients and families in some way to, to accomplish that? Actually, my first time here, I got to meet Ed Salazar, who was a respiratory therapist and his son died because he had an uh, occluded endotracheal tube. Mm. And I think it was in his unit in the hospital. So uh, that impacted me more than anything. The fact of the matter is that our family and our patients can get hurt and they can die. Um, so that was one of the things that we, uh, embrace, got us really started with this. We then started a patient safety uh, committee and today it's, a, it's like a round table uh, type of a thing where we have over 100 members where we share ideas and concepts of ways that we can help bring down preventable deaths. Mm -hmm. um, in our Congress this year, in our convention, we had a closing ceremony where we brought Ed Salazar back and he talked about his uh, story. We also talked with another respiratory therapist from Utah mm -hmm. uh, who was part of a situation where there was a patient that went home, he had had a tonsillectomy, I believe, and was on opioids, but he only took a half of the dose. But he died in his sleep, and uh, he wasn't monitored. And uh, they wanted to do something positive about that, so they worked with the physicians, the administration, and the state senate. And they were able to get a bill passed, a resolution, where they can start moving towards, hopefully, addressing this on a statewide level, Hopefully, we can do this on a national level too. Yeah, those are the you know one of the great things about this this um, movement and summit is the collaboration with our policymakers. Uh, it is so powerful when we can see things happen at that level. I, we've talked about transparency, and I know one of the comments from the audience uh, that came in too is, you know, how do we prevent what you dealt with from happening? you know, how long, right down to the day, you remember when someone was honest with you. And isn't that disappointing? And isn't that embarrassing? And all the emotions that we all have associated with that. And, you know, I live in Pennsylvania where we have um, a patient safety authority that's been in place for quite a while. And, you know, we are required to disclose, even if it's in a perfunctory letter, right? But I'm curious, Cliff, you know, as you think about those variables, what are some of the things that you've seen help accelerate that transparency or are levers maybe that would advance, advance that thinking? I can just take you back to a previous role I had as the CEO of the Clinical Excellence Commission in New South Wales, responsible for safety and quality across 254 hospitals, um, 2 million plus admissions per year. Um, a population of 7.4 million people. 
Um, we didn't know what to do. The minister asked me to take on the role. Uh, I had a board chair, Bruce Barraclough, who was a previous president of, of ISQA uh, and, and a great leader, uh, was my board chair and myself. We had no other board members. We had 12 staff, uh, nine of whom were admin staff. And we said, what do we do? We thought, well, the first thing we should do is actually ask people. And we had two communities to ask. We had our staff and we had our patients. And so we started asking, what's going wrong? And they told us. And we, we provided a, an anonymous uh, online uh, program for reporting. Anybody could get online if they had a staff uh, membership. The patients had to go through a complaint process, which, again, was probably slow on the uptake from our point of view. Yeah. Uh, but we started to get some answers. Uh, not only about what went wrong, but what we should do. And, and to our horror, we, we found that the biggest problem that we were seeing in our hospitals were people on a general ward. They got through the ITU. They got through the theatre. They got through ED. They're on a ward. And, and they lay there, calmly, quietly, needlessly dying mm. because we didn't recognise the triggers that we should have recognised. So we asked why, uh, and, and Tom, you'll be interested in this, that the, the number one reason why was that no one was measuring the respiratory rate in these patients. Mm -hmm. And yet we knew that there were two groups who knew how important respiratory rate was. Mm -hmm. It was the staff themselves. The reason they weren't measuring because it took too long. Got to stand there for a minute counting the breath rate. Right. Uh, but the other one was the family members. Mum would come in and say, there's something wrong with Tommy, he's breathing too fast. Or somebody would walk in and say, my dear old aunt is really struggling to breathe. They knew, we didn't. Well, we closed mine, we weren't being mindful. So we introduced a whole new program. Just to divert from healthcare for a moment, we went to the surf lifesaving movement. Okay. And we said, how come since 1937 to uh, 2004, I think it was, there had not been a single death of a swimmer between the flags on a New South Wales beach, up and down the coast? Not a single death. They said, that's oh, very simple, Doc, we watch. I said, I'm sorry? <laughs> <laughs> we watch. Because if we wait for the swimmer to wave their, their hand, it's too late. And the penny dropped. So we built a whole system and we asked the Surf Life Saving to people if we could use their logos and they said yes. Uh, and we called it Between the Flags. We redesigned our charts so that anybody could see when a patient's parameters were outside acceptable levels, including the respiratory rate. You know, for the next four years, we saved 1,500 lives by a simple thing as reconfiguring a chart not just the chart itself, but on the obverse of the chart, well, what to do in your facility. So it varied, depending on whether you're in the tertiary facility or a little tiny country hospital. A little tiny country hospital, if someone was outside the norm and needed transfer, you called the paramedics to come across and help manage the patient until the helicopter arrived. Exactly. It was such a simple thing, but we asked the people who were involved, yeah. listened to them, and asked them how we should change the system, and they did. Yeah, that's a powerful story of so many good points in it. One, just asking. I've never asked a healthcare worker or a colleague or a patient or family what they thought and that they wouldn't tell me. They always are willing to share. We are not willing to listen. listen. And I think that's part of, of, of our failure. Um, and the fact that you also chose to reach into another industry that did it better yeah. than you, Absolutely. better than us, and were humble enough and thoughtful enough to say, teach me, teach me what I don't get. How can you do this when I can't? Um, so kudos to, to your leadership in that Very and cool. emulating those values of humility and listening and learning. Tom, you had a comment. I could yeah, hear. you mentioned about respiratory rates and, and that type of thing. When I was a director at a hospital, a 500-bed hospital, my medical director would come to me and say, Tom, your patients, they keep coming back to the ICU. What's going on? 
as if we, it was our fault. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was, I'm not sure. But what we did was we put together a way that we can determine the patient, are they ready to leave the ICU? And we did it with the physicians and the nurses and all who are related to the care of that patient. And then we scored that patient at their mm -hmm. risk level. And then based upon that, if they were ready to go, they'd have protocols that the therapist would follow as they take care of them on the floors. But I think oftentimes they leave the ICU and they're forgot about. Yeah. And they can bounce back quite easily. They need to be assured that they're ready to go when they do. Yeah. yeah. So Tamara, yeah, can I just... Please. I've been fortunate enough to learn so much from Cliff and Cliff who's taught Dave. And Cliff often talks about mindfulness. And I just want to share how you know, we in healthcare can help other organizations as well. So um, it was a year ago and I was on a cruise and you have to take the little tender ships from the cruise ship to the different places. On the way back, the waves were really bad and they were struggling to get us off the tender onto the ship. And I had my young son and it started getting so bad that you could feel the angst on the tender and it was hitting against the ship hitting and hitting, and my back was there. And so next thing you know, the assistant captain, there's a bunch of people trying to get us off. We had hit that water started leaking in. And I can see the fear on my son's face. And so I literally turned so that he wouldn't see when we were gonna hit the ship. Mm -hmm. We hit the ship one too many times and the fiberglass broke and I took the brunt of it. So I'm in a tank top and I have blood all up and down my back. And we get everyone off, I get off, I go, I have glass picked out. But the part of the story that was interesting is I'm sitting in my room and I'm thinking, well, eventually they're gonna call me because they're gonna wanna talk about what happened. Mm -hmm. And having already been down this road with my daughter, mm -hmm. I waited and I waited and I thought, I'm not gonna wait again. And I called them. I said, do you have a safety champion on the ship? And they're like, we do, we have a safety officer. And I said, I'd like to meet with a safety officer and the captain of the ship. I was the one that was injured. And you need to learn what you could do better. And so what happened, the, the captain couldn't come, but the second in charge who was actually there and saw it and the safety officer came. And I had a debriefing with them to say you weren't inside the tender. You did not see what was happening and here's what could have been done better. Mm -hmm. And my point is had I not learned what I've learned from healthcare and what had gone on, I would not have been mindful to take the next step because I thought of what you and David said, if I just did nothing, mm -hmm. it's stasis. But I put something into action and for once it was healthcare giving back to another industry. That's incredible. Yeah. And, and to be able to channel, you know, your, your grief and loss so positively, it's just amazing, just amazing. I, I couldn't be more proud to sit beside you and hear those stories and thank you for that effort and that energy and, and, and above all, uh, caring enough because it does come down to that. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that strikes me is that we keep going back to this concept of leadership, right? It really does start from the top and, and the importance of how it sets our culture, it establishes the framework, it does everything. And so many times I do believe that this work, people believe can be delegated. Um, you know, watching hospital presidents when you ask them about, well, who's really responsible for this? And they'll say, oh, it's my CNO, or it's my vice president of respiratory, or it's my chief medical officer. Um, curious to hear some thoughts maybe from you, Helen, too, about how in the organizations you've been, were you just fortunate enough to get the right CEO? Or how do you help those folks accept that responsibility? Because I, I wanna come back to you, Carol, about the fact that the organization you were dealing with didn't obviously initially accept that responsibility. Yeah, you know, I'm, um, it's interesting to reflect back. I left an organization because I didn't agree with the leadership, so that you do have power to leave and go someplace else if they won't listen. Um, but the last two organizations I've been in have been terrific. Um, and I, I think part of it is um, it's the leader 
who can set the tone. So we put quality and value at the very front of our strategic plan and uh, we have our bold goals every year and they are endorsed all the way through the organization. Um, and then it's that leader that also says, I need a little help around here to get it figured out. Um, so, um, but Barry Arbuckle, who leads Memorial Care, he is on our quality committee. He comes to all of our quality you know, um, reviews. He, he sits and goes on rounds. Um, he's, he's just you know, ever present. But he also knows that he needs a family around him. And, and our senior team really is a family. It's very clinically um, focused as well. We have a lot of clinicians on the team. And so we do daily safety huddles across Memorial Care where we're coming together. Um, the CEO is there, but so is the rest of the team. And then if something's coming, say, well, I'll take that and you take that. And so it's kind of this ready huddle break model. But um, I think it does go back to the leader creates the tone. Uh, and without Barry's support, we would not have tied. For example, yesterday we talked about, um, we have part of our incentive uh, program is tied to reducing harm and getting to our goal. Um, and that uh, is something that Barry supported. Uh, so there is that sort of creating the construct um, that is just, I mean, so important. Yeah, that's, uh, well, that's great. And I think some, uh, the, the comments of the huddle and that kind of, in your, in your kind of face every day, yeah. this is your job, this is the responsibility, probably has, has, uh, has leveraged that. Um, because you're right, I can't remember which panelist said, you know, I think it was you, Helen, do people know their mortality rates as well as they know what their uh, cash flow was last month? And, you know, I, I talk a lot about the quality and safety as a business platform as opposed to a business platform. Mm -hmm. And I still think that many organizations are evolving and figuring out that quality and safety is the business platform for healthcare. And using that as a lens helps you to change it. Um, but one of the questions that came in from the audience, um, Carol, was uh, they were curious about did the hospital uh, initially view the C. diff as a preventable event? Or did they just kind of say, hey, well, it happens? Um, and what really triggered them to finally step up and accept responsibility for your, for your daughter's infection? So um, they cultured my daughter for C. diff and rotavirus, and it had to get sent off to the CDC because they had a couple kids that had passed away and they thought there was a virulent strain mm -hmm. on the oncology floor. I did not know this until afterwards. And for Alicia and others that fight these infection battles, you know, we were talking how important would it be as a patient walking in to know what is the infection rate? What are we walking into that, that we get a choice to say, oh, don't want to come here. That's not going to look so good for us. So, um, you know, when we finally found that out, that was just, you know, one of many things that we don't know, the chicken or the egg, what came first. What's interesting is I actually sit on the board of quality um, at this organization now. And it took us a long time to get to where we could trust each other again. And, and someone from the outside, a gentleman by the name of Michael Leonard, that many of you Michael may well. know, yeah, who well. you know is a big in the safety field, he came in, sort of had to broker a conversation. Yeah. And what was interesting when I finally sat down at the table, with everyone is they started to tell me everything on my daughter's record. And I put up my hand and I told them to stop. I said, I can probably tell you the page and the line because I've read that thing. And Michael leaned over and he said, have you ever asked Carol what happened? And it was the first time that anyone had ever heard what I saw and what happened. And sadly, all I think of is all those years of lost learning. Mm -hmm. And that's why to ask, I think your comment, Cliff, so much, ask us. Just ask us and we'll tell you because there's so many valuable insights we can give because you all as clinicians come through the revolving door. You get 10 minutes. We're a constant. We see 24-7. Yep. And nobody knows our family better than us. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're down to the last few minutes. I, Helen, I don't know if you'd want to share any final thoughts here. Well, just, um, uh, I was talking to Tammy earlier, and um, not to go too far into it, but my father died of a medical error. And uh, the one thing I always um, 
have been struck by is that when I called the hospital and said, guess what, I did what you did, I was like, I'm just gonna jump in there. And of course, I was probably their worst nightmare. They're like, uh-oh. Um, but they actually took the time to sit down with us. They, it was immediate, it was within a week. 15 people in a room with a surgeon and the anesthesiologist and everything. And um, to this day, my mother says um, that while she, of course, wishes it had never happened, um, the fact that they took the time and she really understood it and they took the time to honor it and to find out. So I mean, this, this idea of fast communication and really explaining things, and even if you don't have all the answers, so I've always been struck by that. And for us at Memorial Care, I just, as soon as we, we just changed, you know, risk was over here and patient in, 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 in performance improvements over here. I'm like, we need to be together and we have to do this right. So I would just encourage everybody to really take that to heart. Wonder, wonderful comment. Um, one of the ways that I found empathy is to be a patient myself. And last, last summer, uh, I had a sore throat. I went to an urgent care center and they said, you're fine. Just here, take these antibiotics, go home. Yeah. By the end of the day, I couldn't even talk. I couldn't even breathe. I turned my neck and I occluded. <laughs> Turned out I had epiglottitis. Yeah. Rare for anybody anymore, but especially an adult. Um, Thankfully, I was taken well care of. I was intubated, I was on a ventilator, but I got to see what it's like on the other side of the tube. Mm -hmm. And it gave me a new appreciation that I never had before. I never want to have again, but <laughs> uh, I, I think that, uh, again, emp being empathetic and caring and loving our patients is really what it's all about. Yeah. We're thankful that... <laughs> thankful you're well. Cliff. I think we need to understand we all have a part to play. Uh, we have a target of zero. But there are many examples, and we've been hearing the last two days, where in part of a hospital, or in one ward, or in one program, we actually have saved lives. Yeah. For that patient, that was zero harm. A and let's build on the steps uh, and use all our connections. I at ISQA, we try and uh, train young people with webinars and with seminars and the like. But we also reach out by way of accreditation to the boards and the management that govern organisations. We actually accredit accrediting organisations to make sure that accreditation is a useful tool. So we look at standards, we look at management, we look at board governance and so on. And we, we go back to the boards and say, you are as much part of the front line as is the nurse or the doctor or the respiratory therapist. Uh, and, and we need to work together because we all have the same ultimate client. It's not the surgeon, it's not the physician, it's not the nurse, it's the patient and their family. That's so true. Carol, we'll, we'll finish with you. So Cliff, I will just add on to that. I've heard many themes at this conference, transparency many times, systems, trust, learning. But there's one word that hasn't come up as much, and it's the one thing, it's the thread through all of them, it's communication. Mm. And the thing is, it takes so many stakeholders. It takes the device companies. It takes the pharmaceutical industry. It takes systems, regulatory, hospitals, healthcare clinicians, patients. It takes all of us to make the system safe. And when you play the game of chess and you put the pieces away, the king and the pawn and all the in between, pieces in between, they all go in the same box. Wow. Well, I can't thank you all enough. It's been a privilege to be a part of this panel and uh, I hope we've energized all of you to make sure you're thinking about, are you really listening? Are you really talking to what your patients and families are experiencing? I have this provocative thought that I've been carrying for a while, which is, you know, we do here in the United States patient satisfaction surveys. We ask everybody, you know, was your room clean? Did we communicate well? Did we tell you about your medications? And as we sit here, we really don't know the breadth and the depth of the problem we're trying to solve. But we know that it's about a mindset and we know that it's about believing and believing in, in zero. What if we asked patients how many times they'd been harmed while they were in a hospital? 
What a very different lens on the problem versus what we have today. And so uh, I thank you all. Joe, you're incredible. You're an amazing individual. It's a privilege to be a part of your organization. And uh, we would not be here without you. So thank you.